Welcome to Unshakable this evening and uh, what a privilege and honor it is to always come together and to be able to just study the Word of God. And welcome, welcome to everybody that's coming in for the first time that has never ever watched our program before. We welcome you. Sit down, relax and enjoy this evening with us as we spend the next 25 to 30 minutes um, just enjoying God and enjoying everything about God. So let's come at this time to the Lord in prayer before we get into anything too heavy tonight. Father, we just thank you. For your word that is true, yea and amen, it's a rock, it's a foundation upon which we build our lives. I thank you that faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And therefore I pray right now that you anoint every single year that hears this particular word tonight, Father. And I pray that that word will fall on fertile ground. It will take root, it will grow and develop and become strong and mighty in the life of the individual. So we give you all the glory, honor and praise for everything that will be accomplished tonight in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you for all the communications that you've been sending us. We always appreciate reading your testimonies and that which God is doing in your life. And uh, it's a great encouragement to us. And uh, also the prayer requests that come through and to pray for every single person that's watching this broadcast. By the way, if you're not watching this program via the television network, but you're work, watching it via social media channels, I also would like to encourage you to like, subscribe and share this particular broadcast so we can get it as far afield as we possibly Possibly can always helps to to basically entertain and to comply with uh, digital algorithms that are out there. Because man, all we want to do is to see the word of God go out far and wide and to be able to touch and influence as many lives as possible uh, during these broadcasts. So tonight I have chosen to title this particular message: "Please God, Fear God, Obey God." And I want to focus specifically on that first little phrase, please God. You know, Jesus made a statement in John chapter 8 and verse 29. And I want to read it for you. It says this, and he who has sent me is with me, Jesus speaking. He says, talks about the father, father sent him. And because the father sent him, he makes a declaration and he, he makes a statement. It says that God is with me. And then he carries on to say, the father has not left me alone. Because we know, he says he'll never leave us nor forsake us. He's always with us. Great is he that's in me. Uh, he, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, etc. So we know God is with us. So, so he makes an affirmation and declaration. But then listen to this. The last little phrase of this particular verse, he says, For I always do the things that please him. For I do the things that please him. So that is sort of like a statement that he makes. And he says, listen, because I am, I know he's with me. I know that he never leaves me nor forsakes me. I know that he never leaves me alone. Um, and that's all as a result of the fact that I always do the things that please him. So when I read that and looked at that, I came to the realization, and this is many years ago, it wasn't just recently, that my life and my conduct it is important to please God. It's important to make sure that my lifestyle, what I do, my attitude, absolutely everything is well-pleasing unto Him. Because when it's well-pleasing unto Him, we please God and many things then manifest and happen in our lives. I'll read to you uh, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 22. And I'm reading from the uh, New English Translation, the NET Bible. And it says, and whatever we ask, we receive from Him. That's also a very powerful statement, a very powerful phrase that's made. Why? Because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing to him. So for me, it's a no-brainer. I understand the importance of our conduct and everything we do to be pleasing unto God. So tonight I felt the need to just focus a little bit on that phrase and focus a little bit on what, what pleases God from Scripture. Because obviously always we go back to the Bible and see what the Bible says that is more pleasing unto God. Because once you understand that, and once you know what God is pleased about, then that makes our lives a lot easier. And it's not what man's opinion is. Please don't go and ask somebody and say to them, listen, you know, what do you think pleases God? No, it is what does the Bible say? If you want any other person's input, rather go to them and say, listen, what verses do you know that tells me about the fact that I can please God? And what is my conduct? What do I do that pleases God? Because we base our lives on the Word of God. It's the Word of God that encourages us and builds us and develops us. So tonight then, let's focus a little bit on that. So obviously one of the first scriptures that are well known known scripture is Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 which states and he was sorry um, but without faith it's impossible to please him 
For he comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. And there's a couple of things I want you just to look at in that verse. The first thing is without faith. Okay, so faith is a precursor, it's a precondition to the ability to actually please God. So here the, 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 the author of Hebrews is making a, a very emphatic statement. He's saying, listen, without faith, without faith, it is impossible, can't happen to please God because everything has to be birthed out of faith. We also know in Romans chapter um, 14, last couple of verses speaks about the fact that if we don't do things out of faith, if it's not faith motivated, that we also going to find ourselves in a place of sin because then you're not following your heart. You're not following your convictions. You don't follow what you believe. And God wants you to fo form an opinion about something. He wants you to decide what you think about something and believe in something. And once you form that opinion and that conviction and what you're convinced about, then you hook your faith onto that and your conduct and your lifestyle is then linked into that. That's why you're not, you don't become a doubting person because that then becomes well pleasing unto God because you're not doubting and you're not, everything you do is from a place of faith. Everything you do is from a place of conviction. Everything you do is from a place of being convinced. Let me give you an example. What do you think? about homosexuality? What do you think about LBGTQ? What do you think about um, divorce? What do you think about substance abuse? What do you think about all these things? What is your opinion? What, have you, what, 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 have you, what are you convinced about? And what forms that opinion? What's the motivation behind it? In other words, is it the Bible? Is it what God thinks? Because, you know, in the book of Malachi, God makes it very clear, I hate divorce. Does that mean that he will not, under circumstances, certain, certain circumstances, accept divorce? I believe there are um, times when he will, but it doesn't mean he has to like it. It doesn't mean that he accepts because he understands the spiritual connotations and what happens in the life of individuals when you get married. Because that is what 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 makes him not a happy chappy, not a happy person. All right. And so therefore God hates divorce. And because he hates divorce, he does not condone it. And he will always go against it. But we know in the Old Testament there was many examples where where uh, people got divorced and it was actually those days were very simple because all they had to do is basically the husband had to write a letter of divorce and that was it. And so in the New Testament, a little bit different because there when you take a wife and a husband and wife come together, there's a spiritual impartation because the two of you become one. And when you divorce, there's the, I believe there's a tearing that happens between the two and that tearing can be extremely destructive and, and can can you know, cause many, many problems in the lives of the individuals as well as their family. So we need to, that's just one example, right? Just one example where God speaks about how important it is to base our opinions on the word of God and not just on self. So don't take marriage lightly. Don't take divorce lightly. Put the, 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 the required input into it before you act on it. And the same with everything else. You know, it doesn't matter what it may be. Um, what is your attitude towards forgiveness? What is your attitude towards any of the other things? Finances, another good one. What is your attitude towards finances? Are you a good steward of that which God placed in your hand? Because God wants you to be a good steward of that which He placed in your hand. Not only money, but every other asset, every other thing that's in your life. You need to be a good steward of it. If you're a pastor and you've got a congregation, you need to be a good steward of that congregation. If you've got a family and you've got children, you've got to be a good steward of your family and of your children. So every single thing that God gives you, whether it be a business, whether it be anything, whatever God places in your hand for your curatorship and care, then you need to look after it. And you need to care for it. And you need to make sure it, it increases, multiplies, and is healthy and strong, et cetera, et cetera. So you do that and you form your opinions from what God says. So therefore, you have to have faith. And faith, without it, it's impossible to please God. So God is pleased when we operate in faith because he knows the results of faith. Not because faith can just be used to, to increase self. Okay, it's not, your faith is not there to increase yourself. Let me just make, make, make that statement up front, all right? Your faith is there to build the kingdom of God and to, and to increase his, his um, kingdom here on earth and to multiply that which he has placed in our hands because he says all the other things are taken care of already. You don't actually need faith for that. Because why? It says, seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. It's a no-brainer. You seek God. You seek his kingdom. All right? And the things, your 
health, your everything will take care of. In that same passage, Matthew 6, the Bible earlier on in that passage talks about the fact that, listen, who cares about the, for the flowers? Who cares for the bird? Who clothes the flowers? Who feeds the birds? You know, and the thing is, God says, are you not more important than they are? And if you are, will God not care for you more than he cares for the birds and for the, for the flowers? Isn't that a, a true statement? If that is true and God is doing that and that is what God wants in our lives, then at the end of the day, I don't really believe you need much faith. You just need to need to know that if you seek God's kingdom and you do his kingdom, it is already there. So I believe faith has been given to us not to necessarily consume and use only on self, but to also use it and, 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 and use it to increase the kingdom of God, multiply the kingdom of God and see his kingdom established here on earth. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. So we understand then that faith is a very strong and important component in dealing with with uh, pleasing God, all right? So we also know that in that same verse, it carries on to say, for he who comes to God must believe that he is. You see, that becomes a foundation stone because you can't have faith if you don't believe God is. Because what are you having faith in then? And because if you believe that God is, and there is a God, and that he is caring for you, and he is um, looking after the, his people, and he is in control of everything, it is in that God that we believe, the one and only God. That's the one that we establish our faith in and put our faith in. And then he says this, that he's a reward of those that diligently seek him. So we know because I spend hours and hours and hours pursuing God, seeking God, getting to know God, know his kingdom, know what his word says, study the Bible. I know that he rewards that. Not that I'm seeking the reward, but I'm seeking a relationship with him. And because I'm seeking a relationship with him, I know that I, he is a reward and I can receive those things. So therefore, when we look at back at 1 John chapter 3, verse 22, where he says, and whatever we ask, we receive from him. Because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing to him. So I do faith, I'm pleasing to him, and it's a re reinforcement and, and under, underwrites what was in Hebrews 11, 6 already here in 1 John chapter 3, verse 22. So we see the, the affirmation, confirmation of the word of God. Let everything be established by two, three witnesses. Yeah, you already have two. And so then we carry on and we see that another very important aspect of being able to please God is to be spiritually minded. So he's talking about faith, having faith in God, standing on his word, trusting him, believing him, being strong in our, our conviction for him. Then we see that there's a principle of being spiritually minded. In the book of Colossians, very interesting, it puts it, to the, it puts it this way. It says, set your mind on the things above. Set your mind. That is a, a conscious decision that you and I make. We choose to take our minds and focus and concentrate on the things of God. Set your mind. Set your mind. It is a, a purpose. It's an intentional thing. It's not something that you are messing around with and just doing, you know, whenever you feel like it. No, you set your mind on the things that are above and not on anything else. So you need to be spiritually minded. So it means you focus on God, God's kingdom, and everything to do with the spirit man. You have to come to the realization that, that the spirit is more real than the flesh. Flesh came out of spirit. Spirit did not come out of flesh. All right. And you need to understand that your spirit man is actually bigger than your fleshly man. If you really had to, if you had to see and look into the spirit, you might be five foot, six foot, whatever, you're in the flesh. But let me tell you, in the spirit, you're mostly eight, nine, ten foot, okay? Because the spirit is more real than the flesh. And the, we are need to really come to terms and come to grips with that revelation and that understanding. So in Romans chapter 8 and verse 6 through 8, it then says this, To be carnally minded is death. To be carnally minded is death. And you'll see now why in verse 8. But it says, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And it says, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it's not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. The reverse of that then is those that are spiritually minded do please God. All right. Because those that are carnally minded cannot please God. It's impossible. They cannot do it, all right? Why? Because it's subject, um, for it's, it's not subject to the law of God. 
A carnally minded man is not subject to the law of God. And I'm not talking about the Old Testament law, the Ten Commandments or anything else that came through on the tablets or whatever. I'm talking to that. I'm talking about God's law given to us in the New Testament, which is even, even a higher standard. <coughs> Excuse me, but God doesn't seek for us to be perfect in a conduct. Although we strive towards perfection and we grow more like God, we must be holy even as He is holy. We must be perfect even as He is perfect. So we strive to perfection because God wants us to be perfect in Him. Do we achieve that before Christ comes? Who knows? You know, we are on a journey. We're going there. Me, I look at man and I think, Lord Jesus, while there is still sin here on earth and while we are still un- the, the, the God of this world amongst us, that's an amazing and a very difficult thing to, to, to do in the natural mind. Can I do it in the spirit? I would like to believe yes. I would like to believe that we can come to a place where we, look, Jesus did it obviously, but he's the only one that did it. And so we need to come to a place where, where, where we so sold out to God. We live so close to him that I have to believe that it's, per, it's possible to be perfect in him. And it's not just a faith statement or a spiritual statement, but it's a fact. Okay, so we become more like him every single day. John made that statement in John 3.30. He says, I must become less, God must become more. So there is definitely a decrease in self and an increase in him in the life of the individual. But we have to be spiritually minded to achieve that. To be spiritually minded is I have to be so aware of the spirit realm and the way that the spirit works and the way that that realm works more than I have to be aware of how the realm of the natural works where I live and, and move. So I need to understand that the spirit realm is already here, that I'm already a citizen of that by my acceptance of Christ. I'm welcomed into his family. I'm part of his family and therefore I've been I'm in this world, but not of this world. And so I need to therefore develop an awareness of the spirit and also an understanding of the spirit. And I do believe that is quite possible. I do believe there's a lot we do not understand yet, but there's a lot that God still wants to show us. And he does show us piece by piece. As I believe we were growing in mature and in mature in him, he will reveal more and more to us because that gives us an insight and understanding of who we are and what we are truly. And because we are created in the image of God and the likeness of God, and God is not a physical man, he's a spirit man, he's a spirit being. And therefore, if I'm created in his image and his likeness, therefore, my spirit is a more critical component of my, of my body, soul, and spirit. So therefore, I need to spend time on getting to know my spirit man and really developing and growing um, that aspect of my life. And to get that image and that picture of being spiritually minded, the only way I can really do that is to get into the Word of God and to understand the Word of God. So we then see another chap- another verse rather in Psalm 147 verse 11. And it reads there, The Lord takes pleasure in those who fear Him, in those who hope in His mercy. Mercy, fear, mercy because of... But it's, this fear is not a... I'm scared or petrified of God. It's talking about a reverential fear. It talks about an awe. It talks about not wanting to offend God. Although I do believe sometimes people need to actually be scared of God, all right? <laughs> because remember, he took out uh, with Elijah, um, uh, uh, he took out the, the, the prophets of Baal, sorry. He took out the prophets of Baal with fire called down from heaven. And so therefore, I think sometimes we need to realize he is the God of fire too. And we need to understand that that you know he's he's quite capable of doing that, but we also know that he loves us, and because he loves us so intensely and with such a, a, a white hot zeal, he loves you and he, me. He will not execute that on us, but at the end of the day, he's he's capable. Right? And so we need. I sometimes think we forget that component of God. Remember, God and sin cannot coexist in the same space. Sin represents darkness and everything that's evil. God uh, represents everything that is good, that is of value, that is great and is beautiful, majestic. When God comes into a space, if there is any darkness in that space, darkness is dispelled instantly. And so therefore, sin cannot coexist with God in the same space. All right. And we need to understand that. And because we, we, we fear God, in a sense that, yes, we he is almighty, he is the great I am, he is all-powerful, he, he can speak a word and he can annihilate this whole planet with a single word. 
That is how great he is. But I don't fear God from a, from a perspective that, that I'm scared of him. I fear God because I don't want to hurt him. I do not want to disrespect him. I want to honor him. I want him to be well pleased with me and as his child. I want him to take pleasure in my presence. I want him to take pleasure spending time with me. That's, that's really what I want. And as I, as I live my life for him, I want him to be pleased with me. And I think that is why uh, John made the statement that, that he, we need to be obedient and we need to do what pleases God. Jesus made the statement. He says, I only do what pleases God. I don't do anything else. I only do what pleases God. And so if it was important to John, important especially to Jesus, how much more important should it be to you and I? And then we see in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 10, it says that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. There's two thoughts I want to highlight in this last verse before we start wrapping this thing up. There's two components here. The one is an increasing in the knowledge of God and the other one is being fruitful in every good work. So to be fruitful in every good work, you need to be obedient to the Spirit of God. You need to be obedient to what He's, what he's, what he's um, instructing you to do. And we know that we eat the good of the land if we are willing and obedient and we do what God wants us to do. So we, we, by doing, being, doing the good works and being obedient to God, we're fully pleasing unto Him because we, we fulfilling His desires. We're fulfilling His instructions. And to be able to do that, I believe we need to increase in the knowledge of Him. So we also know that when we do increase in the knowledge of Him and we do study the Bible, He's a rewarder of those people. Okay, because he wants us to actually pursue and study and get to know him more. He wants us to, to pursue and study the kingdom of God. He wants us to pursue and get to know him better. He wants us to be, pursue and get to know the realm of the spirit better. And so God wants us to do that. As we increase in our knowledge and we're obedient to him, we're also pleasing God. So we see that as a very clear instruction of, of what God wants to do. So let me summarize this thing for you into three maybe statements. There's many other scriptures and verses I can go through, but I thought, let me just pick a couple because we've got limited time. But let me just summarize this thing for you quickly in a couple of phrases here. Your attitude's important, all right? That talks to me about what you think and what you meditate on and how you treat God and what you, that's the fear, that's the reverential fear, that's the awe, that, that is the worship attitude towards God, worshiping Him in spirit and truth. It is, it is how you approach God, our attitude. Then our relationship, okay? How do you relate to God and to people? How do you relate to them? Do you honor them? Do you respect them? Or do you take them as your buddy or your friend? You know, how do you do this? Do you honor and respect the gifting? In the lives of individuals and people? Uh, do you honor the call that God has placed on individual people? Do you honor and respect them for where God is, what God is doing in them and through them? Not because of them necessarily as individuals, but because of what God's doing through them and what God is using them to accomplish for His kingdom. So we honor and we respect the gift within the person and individual. And we also honor and respect God because that is where the fear of God then comes in. So we honor and we respect Him. And then our conduct. What we do, our works, all right? Because James makes it very clear. He says, listen, you will demonstrate your faith by your works. If your faith, if there is no, is no works, your faith is dead. And so he talks about the fact that your action, your deeds will complete your faith at the end of the day. So your faith is brought to perfection by what you do. And so therefore, obedience of God and rather just doing whatever you want to do, whenever you want to do and how you want to do it because it makes you feel good. No, that's not what it's about. It is being obedient to the word of God, establishing his kingdom, filling the great commission, sharing the gospel, sharing Jesus with people, letting them know that God loves them, Jesus loves them, that he died, that he gave his blood, shed his, shed his blood for them so they do not have to. And all they have to do is accept him as their personal Lord and Savior. So why don't you do that today? If you've never accepted Christ into your life, maybe that's your opportunity today. Maybe it's your turn today to turn from Christ. Maybe you've made the decision many times, but you've backslid and you've called to the things of the Lord. 
Maybe there's onslaughts and attacks you've had, things that have happened in your life that, that has robbed you, stolen from you, uh, left you cold. But God wants to come today and renew his, his relationship with you. All you have to do is accept him. Bible says, believe in your heart, confess in your mouth that he is Lord and you will be saved. Become part of the family of God. So as you do that today, I believe God is going to impact you, touch you, change your life. That it will never, ever be the same again. Let me just close with the verse that I opened with. And that verse was John chapter 1 John chapter 3, and verse 22. So, and of whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing to him. Go out and do the mighty works of Jesus. Until next week, we love you, we bless you, and see you then.